All right, so we're just going to jump into the first session. What we're going to do is have uh, three different short 10-minute uh, intros, uh, um, and then we're going to have a conversation, and I'll uh, ask some questions, and this is going to be the, the way uh, things will run in these plenaries. So this first session uh, is, folk and don't worry about the time. What we'll do is just go 15 minutes into the, the tea, so we'll still have an hour for each of these sessions. So this first session is focused on looking back in the history and evolution of environmental justice. So we have Professor Robert Bullard, who's really the, the sort of original core scholar, the father of environmental justice. Uh, he's a distinguished professor of urban planning and environmental policy at the Barbara Jordan Mickey Leland School of Public Affairs at Tux Texas Southern University. Uh, he received his PhD from Iowa State. He's the author of 17 or more books that address sustainable development, environmental racism, urban land use, industrial facility siting, community reinvestment, housing, transportation, climate justice, emergency response, smart growth, uh, and more. Uh, he's just published uh, an immense amount, uh, and his work is just the standard in the field. So we'll ask Professor Robert Buller to come up for our introductory talk. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, first of all, th uh, I want to thank the sponsors of this conference for inviting me. I'm uh, really um, honored and, and pleased to be back um, uh, to Australia. And uh, I, uh, I see this conference as very important. And having, uh, making those um, historical links between the past and going forward and what we see as, as um, environmental justice and, and what we need to do to, to address a lot of the issues that are confronting us. Uh, my, my task is to look back and, and looking back I can look back uh, uh, at least almost four decades and I can also look back uh, well almost four decades when I started the work in Houston uh, dealing with um, uh, landfills and incinerators and waste and looking at the, I guess, the, the racial dynamics involved in that. And I can also look back two months uh, dealing with the devastation in, uh, in Houston and the Gulf Coast with uh, Harvey, Irma, um, and Marie in uh, Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands. Um, the environmental justice um, research in its very infancy, was designed uh, to support movements. It was not to get tenure. It was not to publish articles. It was not to write books, but it was to support a movement. And so environmental justice framing um, early on was framed in the context of, of racism, structural racism, um, inequity and vulnerability based on class, socioeconomic status, and spatial inequality based on place. Uh, the, the early work um, that, that I was involved in, in a personal way, was, as I said before, was designed to bring uh, to the surface the intersection of science, policy, um, education, health, and human rights. Um, the, the whole idea of trying to unravel and unpack the impact of unrestrained capitalism and structural uh, uh, and institutional racism to bear on producing results that disproportionately impacted uh, poor people and people of color and provided benefits and advantages for, for rich people and, and white people. Uh, the, the idea of the environmental justice movement being initially born in the southern United States in Warren County, North Carolina, um, in the south, the same region of the United States that gave us the civil rights movement. So it's not by accident that environmental justice and civil rights, human rights were intertwined. There was no separation. If we look at over the years when we, um, looking at the research that was done, whether it was United Church of Christ, Commission for Racial Justice, 
Toxic Waste and Race Study, 1987, or My Dumping and Dixie Book, 1990, uh, or the other books that came after that. And I might add that 1990, Dumping and Dixie was the only book on environmental justice. So when I got uh, my first royalty check, I didn't know Westview had made it a, a textbook. It was really nice check. Uh, if you look at 2017 and Google or go to Amazon.com, there are hundreds of books on environmental justice in a range of areas. Environmental justice research was about liberation research. It was about addressing um, and applying uh, data and findings to impact something in a positive way. It was action research, research legal policy, and mobilization. Uh, the, the idea of moving environmental justice from uh, the small, isolated uh, struggles to moving it to, uh, oops, moving it to mobilization, uh, when that happened on a national basis in the United States, it was the first national people call the Environmental Leadership Summit. And the summit was designed uh, and funded by the United Church of Christ Commission for Racial Justice, a black civil rights organization, church-based, faith-based. Um, and the, the summit developed uh, 17 principles of environmental justice, which stand to this day as, um, as principles. Uh, the summit delegates were people of color, African Americans, Asian and Pacific Islanders, Native and indigenous people, uh, and uh, Hispanics, Latinos. It covered every state in the United States from Alaska to Puerto Rico and the territories. First two days with people of color only to unpack the racism, colonialism, and all the isms. Second four days was to bring everybody in, to be inclusive. The, the summit was attended by at least 12 countries, including Canada, uh, Mexico, uh, so, um, uh, Nigeria, Co uh, Colombia, Brazil, Chile, um, and U and from UK. The, the 1991 summit translated the, um, the principles into real life actions. And the idea was we would take those principles and move it to back to our communities, but also connect with the global. Um, the summit was in 1991. And by 1992, June, when the Earth Summit in Rio uh, happened, those 17 principles had been translated into uh, at least a half dozen languages, including uh, Spanish and Portuguese. Um, when we look at the, the summit and the, the People of Color Summit and the Earth Summit, uh, those two events establish the, the international legitimacy of our movement and the research that followed and interaction that followed to support uh, uh, subsequent summits, uh, uh, UN summits, and the, 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 the whole idea was to make sure that our research and policy and our civic engagement, public uh, participation uh, would reach into not just the national scene, but also the global and international. In 2000, at the COP6 in The Hague, um, we uh, organized um, the first climate justice summit, planned for 500 people, 1,000 people. This is a year 2000, when you start moving, you know, talking about decades of work, uh, you can see that the, the Melbourne Conference in 1997 also brought a lot of the same people that had come to the first summit and had come to start to doing the research and start collaborating and it introduced the topic to folks who had never heard of this whole idea. Um, the, the, the whole idea that environmental justice um, basically embraces this whole idea that, that, um, uh, that there's a lot of uh, structural uh, constraints that impede a healthy, livable, and sustainable environment. Let me just read you, finally, the principle, uh, the preamble to the principle of environmental justice. Let me see, how many of you have, have read the principle of environmental justice? Good, that's everybody. Okay, uh, it says, we the people, this is in um, September, October, uh, 19, October 24th, 1991. Uh, we the people of color gathered together at this multinational people of color environmental leadership summit to begin to build a national international movement of all peoples of 
color to fight the destruction and the taking of our lands and communities, do hereby reestablish our spiritual interdependence to the sacredness of our Mother Earth, to respect and celebrate each of our cultures, languages, and beliefs about the, nat about the natural world and our roles in healing ourselves, to ensure environmental justice, to promote economic alternatives, which, we, which would contribute to the development of environmental, environmentally safe livelihoods. This is really small. And to secure our political, economic, and cultural liberation that has been denied for over 500 years of colonization and oppression, resulting in poison of our communities and lands and genocide of our peoples. Do affirm and adopt these principles of environmental justice, the principles of environmental justice. Uh, those principles have been the formation of additional principles at different meetings, you know, in, in Durban, you talk about cl uh, the climate justice principles and, and going forward, other kinds of principles that, that, f that spring from the whole idea that, um, that peoples in different parts of the world uh, have to confront the, the, the monsters that create inequality. In addition, not just um, inequality when it comes to people, but also inequality when it comes to the physical and natural environment. Thank you very much. Thanks, Professor Bullard. I, I should say, you know, for scholars that haven't looked, the, the, it, everybody focuses on the principles that come out in the preamble, and it's beautiful stuff. But for me, at, reading the proceedings of that meeting, and I don't know if those are still available somewhere. I remember getting this booklet. There's some amazing conversations uh, that went on and some incredible stuff in the proceedings of that 1991 uh, meeting. So I encourage folks to go back to that. So next up. Um, is the lead organizer of the 1997 Environmental Justice Conference at the University of Melbourne, Professor Nick Lowe. Uh, he's the author and editor of 10 books. He's known for contributions to the study of planning uh, and transport for his international research on urban sustainability. Um, and the book that came out of the 1997 conference, an edited collection on justice, society, and nature with Professor Brendan Gleeson, uh, won the Harold and Margaret Sprout, Sprout Prize of the International Studies Association for the best uh, best book published in environmental politics. And that was also, that was uh, an awakening, I think, that, that you know, the ISA, the International Studies Association, recognized the importance uh, of environmental justice in that time. So, Professor Lowe. Okay, um, <laughs> good morning, <laughs> hello. Look, um, uh, first of all, of course, thanks, very many thanks to David and his Sydney team for inviting me, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here. I'm also delighted that uh, David has covered um, probably most of the first two pages of what I've got to say, so I can dunk those, hooray. Okay, not entirely, though. I was going to say a few words about um, uh, Bob, Bob Bullard. Uh, I mentioned also Beverly Wright and Bunyan Bryant, who are also at the conference. Um, but, you know, we have Bob here, so, um, and, uh, you know, you've heard from him, so I won't say any more about that. Um, I, I, I'm extremely pleased to hear from Professor Troy, Dr. Troy, uh, because the indigenous question is enormously important justice to indigenous people, injustice to indigenous people. And I just remind you that uh, we had in 1997, we had indigenous scholars, Henrietta Formile and Marcia Langton, um, who had taken up that uh, theme very strongly, of course. 
uh, as well as those, some of those who've studied indigenous cultures like Deborah Rose Bird and James Tully. Um, so we had uh, really a huge um, range of uh, conversations. And of course, as David says, the conversations are the thing, really, uh, not the keynotes. So I'm hoping I can, um, yeah, well, just, just some uh, acknowledgements to uh, the team in 97. Um, where do we go now? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, we did want to bring together the, the idea of distributional justice for the, on the environment, um, environmental justice in the, in the sense of the uh, United States movement, and uh, the idea of ecological justice, justice to nature. And that was our kind of initial, um, well, sort of leitmotif, our theme to try to bring those together. But in fact, we had a huge range of conversations as, as David says, I just sort of, I mean, these are some of the papers, some of the themes which occurred, um, which were very wide and, and enormously enlightening and um, reflected in immense depth of, of scholarship and research. Um, so we could just go, oh yeah. Arnie Ness um, opened our conference. Uh, and he said that the advancing frontier of environmental justice is long and contains irreducible difference. And he also said something which today resonates, I think. People, he said, people can be more easily made to change their opinions about facts than their basic views about what constitutes justice. I think that is extraordinarily true because people have an, a sort of inherent, inbuilt, hardwired sense of what is just, what is fair, what is unjust. I think as humans we have that. So, um, well, this brings me to the bit between 97 and uh, 2016. Um, and I had to do a lot of revision very rapidly and I, think, I was thinking, how am I going to cut through the enormous scholarship which has gone on around environmental justice since 97? because I'd been doing something else. So I just took, um, with slight, slight apologies for self-promotion, my book with, with Brendan Gleeson, Justice Society in Nature, The Green State. And I wanted to get on to uh, the present, uh, the, my present concerns, which are kind of reflected by Wolfgang Streich, a, a German sociologist called How Will Capitalism End? And each of these books deals in different ways with the three main challenges identified by Robin Eckersley to greening the state. Let's see if I can get this up. Yeah. The anarchic character of the system of sovereign states, uh, the promotion of capitalist accumulation, and the democratic deficits of the liberal democratic state. Well, I think you probably all know, you know these books, these arguments, these discussions pretty well, so I can move through them very quickly. Uh, the first book, um, uh, well, yeah, all of the, well, no, the first two books deal with the question of ecological justice via the idea, which David has explored, of the recognition of nature. And that's, at the moment, all I'm going to say about that. Um, we'll, <laughs> there'll be a lot of discussions around, around ecological justice and justice to nature, I'm quite sure, at this conference. Um, but, but, well, um, Justice Society in Nature, we, we were uh, basically addressing the anarchic global system of nation states. And we, we were trying to find a sort of pragmatic series of steps, uh, which seemed at the time fairly modest. Now they seem almost out of sight. But um, what we proposed were uh, some steps towards cosmopolitan democracy, a world environment court, which would be created under the auspice of a World Environment Council, which would in turn debate the principles of justice to be applied. I think that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, <laughs> the proposition is fairly flawed, as I think John Dreisek pointed out. Nations jealously guard their sovereign rights. Uh, democratic control of a World Council would be near impossible, as Wolfgang Strake himself actually discusses in relation to the European Union, which is not a very democratic uh, system, really. Um, world institutions would be subject to capture by economic elites and their ideologies. 
Um, so book two, uh, The Green State by Robin Eckersley, filled in the enormous gap in the discussions addressed in book one, um, namely the question of liberal democracy and the nation state. So The Green State was, for me, a, a sort of pivotal book um, talking about uh, the nation state and um, its institutions. Um, Robin Eckersley put, in, put forward an ambit claim for ecological democracy that the opportunity to participate or otherwise be represented in the making of risk generating decisions should literally be extended to those, all those potentially affected regardless of social class, geographic location, nationality, generation, or species. And she says, this claim is most likely to be redeemable through deliberative democracy via unconstrained dialogue, inclusiveness, and social learning. Uh, looking, I think, to the work of Jürgen Habermas. Um, well, now I want to come on to the one you won't probably have heard that much about, but some of you may. That is Wolfgang Strake's How Will Capitalism End? Strake is a German sociologist who has much to say about the social injustice in the way the global capitalist economy has developed since World War II. Uh, Strake uh, brings a Polanyan, that is the um, um, political sociologist Karl Polanyi, uh, perspective to the relationship between um, capital and the state, the democratic state. Uh, in Strake's view, it is the political contest between two principles of entitlement, entitlement of citizens versus entitlements of property in democratic arenas in the post-war years that has actually saved capitalism from collapse. Capitalism as a system tends to expand beyond its proper domain, the trading of material goods into three resources called by Polanyi fictitious commodities, labor, land, or nature, and money. A fictitious commodity is one that can only be treated in a regulated way, since complete commodification will destroy it or make it unusable. Strake documents three long-term mutually reinforcing trends, a persistent decline in the rate of economic growth, an equally persistent rise in both public and private indebtedness, and the growth of economic inequality of both income and wealth. He's talking about the global capitalist system as it's developed. So over the post-war years, liberal democratic states engaged, he says, in a series of settlements of the capital labor conflict that enabled capitalism to survive, each of which was successively undone by the internal contradiction between the entitlement logic of capitalism and that of democracy. The tension between the conflicting justice principles of democracy and capitalism during the 20th century have modified capitalism in such a way as to allow it to survive each stage of its ongoing crises up till now. But today, he argues, the nation state upholding citizen entitlement is so weakened by globalization that further modification of capitalism is looking increasingly unlikely with the result that a destabilized capitalism will end the only remaining question is how and with what results. Uh, so Strake, Strake's analysis points to the urgent need in the, in the interest of social justice to rescue and re-strengthen the nation state, purged of its neoliberal ideology, uh, as the only democratic institution capable of controlling capitalism and, it, and its elites. This could mean a green state, uh, which is also a socialist state in some form, or vice versa. Well, uh, I wanted to just, um, that's strike. I wanted to just uh, run through a few lurid headlines in um, August uh, press institutions like The Age and Le Monde. Um, and I'm certainly not going to spend any time talking about them. They're self-evident, I think, uh, relating to the injustice of the capitalist system as it is developing at the moment. Um, and we have this sort of thing. Uh, the, um, the lies which are told about uh, around um, climate developments. Um, well, um, entitlement. Remember, Joe Hockey talked about um, entitlement. It's quite interesting what he says. I went back to his speech. He's uh, 
former treasurer, uh, what he wanted to talk about was how Western democracies have been reluctant to wind back universal access to payments uh, and entitlements from the state. These are the entitlements of citizenship in a democracy, Medicare, public hospitals, education, and so forth. He wasn't talking about winding back the entitlements of property and capital. That, like, you know, the theory of Robert Nozick, some of you may know, the entitlement theory of justice, that's the entitlement of capitalism. Um, and uh, of course the only entitlements that the liberal government, this government, this democratic government can actually attack and roll back with some impunity are those of the poorest and most powerless in society. Uh, so where are we? Um, I've totally lost my place, but never mind. Uh, looking back from today's perspective, it is striking how the far-reaching were the normative ideals expressed in the 97 conference. Uh, so we need to continue to make ambitious ethical claims, I think. We have institutions that represent and are founded upon ideals of justice. We have the UN, FCCC, Paris Agreement, and so forth. Um, what seems to have come a long way since 97 is the progress of ecological modernization. Uh, we, well, you know, we're looking at the institutional hardware, some dynamic sectors of corporate capital have embraced new low carbon technologies, rooftop solar energy has freed individuals to make and store their own electric power on site. Uh, turning to the software, the, the discourse, uh, and the hope of bottom-up progress towards a discursive and or deliberative democracy, the results seem to me rather mixed. On the one hand, there could hardly have been advances in the institutional hardware and ecological modernization without growing worldwide grassroots movement focused on climate change and the environment. Scientists and science journalists are standing up and defending their knowledge in the public domain. Um, yeah, well, well. well. On the other hand, we have today, which we hardly had 20 years ago, what looks like a global discursive democracy called the Internet. But it isn't. It is not. It is a global discursive market. Democracy requires norms and rules and political institutions and social conditions. The discourse market is without rules, except for those around the ownership of the software, which is, of course, in the hands of mega capitalist corporations, Facebook, Twitter, Google, and the rest. Discourse. I suggest, is a fourth Polanian fictitious commodity which without regulation has the potential to destroy capitalism, democracy, and the environment. Um, well, advocates of discursive or deliberative democracy were not wrong, but partially right. Discourse is important, perhaps crucially so. But a discourse without rules of evidence is a post-fact world in which lies have, a much, have at least as much traction with the public as science-based environmental discourse. Well, I'm thinking that we need to look much, uh, much further back than 20 years and much wider than the discourse of environmentalism to think and plan benign paths to the future for our planet and, and its inhabitants. And like Wolfgang Strake, I don't have any solutions to offer to the current crisis of capitalism, except to say simply that socialism and environmentalism uh, must find common cause. Ecological justice cannot make progress without social justice and vice versa. Thank you. So let's see, that's uh, nature, the democratic state, and capitalism. Not much to deal with in the, the last 30 years. Um, Look, we're gonna, um, we'll bring people up for a conversation in a minute, but first, uh, or in 10 minutes, I should say, sorry, but, um, but first, um, third uh, in this introductory section, uh, Professor Petra Checkert. Um, Petra uh, has been working quite broadly on human environment interactions, on rural livelihoods, on environmental change, on marginalization, uh, and societal transformation. Uh, she's a geographer, but she's also, well, not but, she's a geographer and um, has also really developed um, some interesting methods of participatory research uh, in environmental justice. And to me, this has been um, one of the more interesting, the, the methodological uh, expansion within environmental justice scholarship uh, has been one of the most fascinating things over the last uh, 30 years. So we'll have Petra uh, give a last 
10 minute intro and then we'll bring everybody up for a conversation. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks, David, for inviting me. And it's an absolute pleasure and honor to be on the same panel with Bob and Nick. So I'm going to take a very specific lens here. I'm going to look at how we can actually make visible environmental justice or environmental injustices. And of course, as a geographer, that's particularly easy, I think. So I would argue that, of course, over the last 30, 40 years, environmental justice research has used maps, right? Maps to visualize, to make visible um, hazardous waste disposal sites, the concentration of toxic materials, clusters of asthma and cancer, and their spatial correlation with minority communities and low-income communities. That has been the standard approach in environmental justice over a long, long time, definitely since the 1970s, right? It's the first introduction to environmental justice very much from a distributional angle, proximity to sites. And of course, like always, there's critique, right? We understand it's not just about distribution. We understand that mapping and maps themselves do not capture the complicated processes behind spatial phenomena. They obscure the spaces of inequality that are produced and they ignore the multiple spatialities. Again, not just about sites, but also about our bodies and our neighborhoods. But let's take a look back, and thanks to Bob, we already have some insight of the origin, the foundational role of environmental racism, environmental justice. So I had to do some digging here to find one of the earliest maps of environmental injustices. And that's out of the report that Bob mentioned, the 1987 United Church of Christ report, a landmark investigation into the geographic distribution of hazardous waste sites, racial minorities, and zip codes. And as a point of reference, you see in blue here, Warren County, North Carolina. And you've listened to Bob, you understand this is where probably the first case of environmental injustice and racism, large protests against a PCB landfill, uh, the poorest count in the state, North Carolina at that time, 84% of the population African American. So this is, of course, a time before GIS, right? We didn't have the fabulous maps yet, hand drawn, and you can read at the bottom, um, well, the distribution of minority populations. And you can see the South, the largest concentration of um, African American here. And if we zoom in, here's an, a map of Atlanta, Georgia, again. Well, this is proximity to hazardous sites. Quite amazing when we look back. Ever since, of course, we have had an abundance of environmental justice and injustice maps. Today, we have the environmental justice screen of the EPA in the US. Um, massive amounts of data, still two demographic, demographic factors that predominate low income and minority population. But this is how it started, and it's important to remember. Of course, over time, we didn't just have proximity maps to dumping sites. We also had, which is really important, an understanding, a spatial understanding of the broader social structures and political economic processes that produce spaces of inequality. And Laura Polito's work here is really important. This is a map that looks a little different from the usual dumping sites and proximity measures. This is a map of LA, and it looks at the correlation between bicycle and pedestrian crash fatalities and median household income. So I'm not sure if you can see it, but the color should point it out to you. Red, low-income communities, low-income neighborhoods, and this is where the fatalities are highest. Why? Poor transportation planning, no bicycle path, no traffic lights that would protect people in low income, very dense communities, neighborhoods in LA, and this is where we have the highest fatalities. Right? Ryan Hollyfield, Michael Porter, and Gordon Walker, who is here, had a special issue in Antipode in 2009. I was lucky to be part of that. And it was called Spaces, Spaces, Spaces of Environmental Justice frameworks for critical engagement, saying we acknowledge the legacy, but we have to move beyond the point sources. 
and move towards more complex understandings and more sophisticated understandings of spaces of environmental justice. Here's one example which I think is important because it takes us out of the US context, takes us out of the emphasis on environmental racism and racial minorities. It takes us to the rest of the world. And I think for me, the most striking example, this is the 1990s, came out of Nigeria, the Niger Delta. Many of you probably remember the story of Ken Sarawiwa fighting for the rights of the Ogoni people against Royal Dutch Shell and uh, crude oil extraction and the dumping of petroleum waste in the Niger Delta. 1995, the hanging of the Ogoni Nine. This particular atlas here, it's called the Environmental Justice Atlas, uh, was launched in 2014. It's a teaching, networking, and advocacy map that catalogs hundreds and hundreds and thousands of stories of resistance against damaging projects around the world. And this is an abundance of case studies, and if you're interested, take a look at it, right? It takes us out of that original context. But of course, there are other spaces of injustice. And I would like to focus on the body here, and this is a particular map I'm going to explain in a second that really influenced the work I have done, which I'm going to introduce in a second. And I think this is at the confluence of actually work outside of environmental justice. It brought to us understandings from occupational health, from participatory research, and participatory GIS that allowed us to see spaces of injustices affecting our bodies. This is a particular map produced by Margaret Keith and James Brough in 2004, that's when the article came out, talking to laborers in an asbestos factory in Canada. And this map shows the workers felt pain, harm, illness on their bodies as a result of exposure to asbestos in the factory. It's a participatory map. The one to the right shows cancer-specific pain. The one on the left, general harm and illnesses. And it's, in fact, a disturbing snapshot of collective ill health among workers. And it was used and accepted as evidence for workers in compensation claims, so quite remarkable. It extended a legacy of occupational health and participatory work and body mapping that was started early on, actually already in the 60s, among factory workers in Turin, Italy. It's a shift also towards more diverse forms of public engagement. How can we bring people who are affected by environmental justice to the fore of the research, make them active participants, and listen to their endurances. Now, where I started to become actually really aware of environmental justice was not so much the typical geographical mapping and the distribution. It was the shift in the early 2000s, and largely also thanks to David's work, from distributional justice to procedural justice paying attention to recognition and participation. So move away from this con conventional focus on proximity, if you want obsession, that actually obscures these other dimensions of environmental justice, recognition and participation. And what's important here is an understanding of misrecognition. People in certain places being stigmatized, branded with negative environmental associations. And this understanding of environmental justice from a procedural perspective really called for, and also thanks to the special issue in Antipode, called for new imaginative and methodologically diverse and theoretically pluralized interventions. And that's what inspired me, and that's when, uh, David, you mentioned it, my work on participatory research in environmental justice space started. So let me lead you through you very quickly on my work on misrecognition and what we will call status injury. I've been working with environmental criminals, quote unquote, environmental and social criminals. These are small scale, artisanal, illegal gold miners in Ghana who are misrecognized, who are ostracized, who are criminalized, branded as criminals because of the use of toxic mercury to extract gold from sediments 
and the social disruption they cause because of their transient lifestyle. Nancy Fraser introduced a term to me that I think fits very well this angle of participatory research in environmental justice. And the term is status injury. It's an institutionalized, systematic devaluation and misrecognition of an entire group of people, these small-scale miners, a subordination excluding them from decision-making processes, from having a voice on how to actually extract gold in a more environmentally friendly way. Status injury. So the question methodologically is, how can we make these spaces visible and how can we counteract misrecognition? So my work has used a series of participatory methods, mapping activity. This is one we call risk mapping. I'll lead you through the bodily harm that you would incur as a gold miner in Ghana. It's not just mercury. It's much more if you're excluded from a safe working environment. It starts slowly with headache. I hope you can read them. Stone cutting. hand-drawn, written by miners. And the last one, the most painful ones. So this mining environment, if you're excluded, if you're not recognized, kills. Nancy Fraser also introduced a term to overcome systematic institutionalized misrecognition. And her term is participatory parity. We have to recognize the people who are exposed to environmental injustices as peers. We have to show respect, and that's what we can do best in collaborative activities in parity fostering spaces or contact zones. As you can see, I used the body mapping introduced from Canada in the space of miners in Ghana. The ultimate goal, of course, is to say, how can we move beyond misrecognition? Martha Nussbaum, another influential scholar for my work, introduced the term sympathetic imagining. How can we encourage flourishing? How can we encourage agency? How can we encourage capabilities that allow us to see beyond the criminalizing elements that are portrayed to us in all kinds of discourses? And here's the miners designing for themselves an ideal mining site. It's not pretentious. They just want a little storehouse for their tools, a machine park for excavators, a poultry house so they would have something to eat on site, a bar, a health post. That's not too much to ask for, right? So where are we now? 2017, coming back all the way to the US, a massive amount of data available through the EPA, probably too much data to understand what's actually happening. A new method, critical storytelling. How can we evoke these voices of people affected, in this case, from transnational trade of hazardous waste? How to humanize data, an example here from the Hass Mass Adventure game, to make visible and accessible the structural processes of the industry and differential opportunities for people to work in. We see here a female truck driver who carries around hazardous waste through the US. Her story, her engagement with the industry, but also her engagement with bullying, with a highly sexist and still racist environment. A story we can follow that allows us to understand the people behind environmental justice. That's my short overview. Thank you. So Bob and Nick, come on up. Bob and Nick, come on up. So, We've got about, uh, about 15 minutes or so left in this session. So 
I'm going to just try and get some, we'll see how this works. I'm going to try and get some conversations going uh, by asking a couple of key questions. <clears throat> We've got some, if we have time left, uh, I'll open it up to you. But So the first question is uh, for Professor Bullard. And so you were obviously key to the founding of environmental justice scholarship, um, you know, starting with this groundbreaking work at the intersection of environment, social injustice, and racism, uh, you know, focused on environmental racism. And then you were also key to expanding the areas where that framework was used, so to, to land use, to housing, to transportation, to health, a whole variety uh, of areas. So clearly in the last 30 years, and as we've seen, the idea, the literature, the conception, the application of environmental justice has continued to expand in the range of topics addressed, uh, in the countries where it's addressed, uh, in the areas that it's been applied. So I guess the, the opening question is, is there anything that concerns you about that expansion, that growth, that development of the discourse, especially as it moves away from that initial focus uh, on environmental racism in the US? No. <laughs> uh, it doesn't concern me uh, that in a place uh, like Iceland, uh, where you may have a homogeneous, that's an example, community, nation where you may not have a racial or ethnic group that's somehow isolated that environmental racism may not be the focus. But in a place like the United States or Australia or countries that have populations where there's a history and legacy of racism, colonialism, imperialism, to not see a frame that includes environmental racism is disturbing. Um, we've moved, as you mature as a movement and as the analysis sharpens and as the uh, methodological tools also become more sophisticated, it's important that uh, we not lose sight from and I'm giving a U.S. perspective, that we not lose sight of you do the study, you do the data, then so what? It's not enough just to sit on the shelf. Uh, how can it be used by the communities that, uh, that the first principle of environmental justice is that people must speak for themselves and the people most impacted must be at the table when decisions are being made. So uh, whenever I see the, the frame of just only looking at the bad stuff and not mapping the good stuff and see who has the good stuff, like housing and good access to healthy foods and quality neighborhoods, I see that as disturbing. Yeah. And I see a lot of that, uh, just looking at the bad side and not looking at who's getting more than their fair share of the good stuff, yeah. the things that make us healthy yeah. and sustainable and livable. Yeah, and your work in planning in Atlanta certainly laid that out the distribution of environmental goods as well. I guess in terms of this long history of environmental justice scholarship and your, and your work, so you've been dealing, as you said most recently, with the impact of Harvey on Houston. So is there anything different now, given this sort of 30-year history of environmental justice? Is there anything different in the response to that impact, uh, either in the local community or in the, the, the national understanding or response to it? Well, uh, a colleague and I, uh, Dr. Beverly Wright, who uh, we did a book in uh, 2012, New York University Press. It's called The Wrong Complexion for Protection, How the Government Responds to Disasters and Dangers in African American Communities. And we tracked 80 years, eight decades of government response to natural and man-made disasters, uh, starting with the Great Mississippi Flood of 1927 and bringing it all the way up to the BP spill of 2010. And what we found um, without whether the uh, hurricanes, floods, fire, uh, f um, wildfires, all kinds of disasters that the U.S. government basically uh, responded in a, in a discriminatory way if it involved a disproportionate share of poor people and people of color. The Harvey, Irma, uh, Marie response to these, these uh, killer storms more recently, you can see how, if you look at Houston, you can see how the, the, the funding for over 50 years of flood control monies was siphoned off and put on the west side of Houston, which is the very affluent side and the white side. 
and very little uh, flood protection is on the east side where mostly people are calling poor people, working class people live. And what happens is that 50 year, uh, we've had three 500 year floods in the, in the last three years. And 50 inches of water was dumped on the city in three days and it f inundated and flooded the entire city, which meant that there was no safe place. And what, it, what, it rec what we recognize now is that when you don't protect the most vulnerable by siphoning off monies that's supposed to be designed to make the place safer, when you siphon off and don't protect the most vulnerable, you place everybody at risk. We saw that in Katrina. And so in Puerto Rico, we see the different response than given from Florida. And it's very clear the groups on the ground now are challenging the federal government and they have the, the wherewithal to use the, the research, the policy, and social media to make their voices heard. Now, whether or not the response is in a way that's uh, commensurate with the problem, environmental racism, environmental injustice in these storms that's happening in the United States is very clear, and you can see it up close and per personal with 24-hour news cycle. So uh, that gets in some way to one of Nick's key questions, which is about how we can possibly re-empower the democratic state, right? So, I mean, one of the key problems, obviously in the U.S., but not only in the U.S., uh, is the, the state hollowing out its expertise, uh, purging uh, uh, that expertise from agencies that would normally respond or provide the data um, for such events. We see, we see the state um, ignoring or delegitimizing um, both scholarly knowledge and then local uh, and um, traditional knowledge as well. So I guess, I mean, the question there really is, it ha does environmental justice um, in, in places like this where um, there are these events, uh, do communities rely too much uh, on the state? Uh, is there some other form of response outside of the state? And has environmental justice had an impact? Um, I mean, the flip side of that is, can or does environmental justice have an impact on states and states' responses? Well, what we see now happening with uh, our federal government, uh, from the president to the cabinet level, erasing uh, science from um, policy and erasing climate from websites and stripping agencies from even uh, having to posting data for communities and regular people have access to it. We see that uh, kind of um, um, uh, strategy to, to make uh, our federal EPA, for example, um, unimportant or pre-1970 when there wasn't an EPA. And so what, what it means, it, it was a wake-up call to environmental groups that uh, in many cases had, um, had gone to sleep and had not uh, factored in environmental justice and health and safety, et cetera, into their agendas, now they're beginning to, you know, come alive back again and to bring the whole issue of health and justice and sustainability back on the radar. There's not a whole lot going on at the federal level, but when it comes to environment, just, environmental justice and climate, uh, it's happening at the city level and within states. And I think that's where we're going to get action. This is just a temporary bump in the road. Um, we, we see that the environmental justice movement is stronger than ever. We have more and more young people. I mean, you have young people who are now, who are in Black Lives Matter, are basically talking about black communities matter, black communities matter, black health matter. And the, these young people are fearless, like we were in the 60s. And so, you know, Black Lives Matter that may have started in the U.S. now is spread abroad. And that kind of energy, I think, uh, we can be you know, those of us who have been doing this a long time, we can be assured that uh, uh, environmental justice will survive these four years. So let me, let me swing this over to Nick as well, because you, know, you used Robin Eckersley's The Green State as one <clears throat> of your examples. Um, and one of the things that Robin argues there is that there's been too much of a focus on the local, and we do need to re, um, refocus, at least a theoretical focus, on the state and greening the state. Um, but that clearly has become problematic. Uh, in a lot of places. So what's this, this, um, this tension between greening the state uh, and empowering uh, the local for you? Free, yeah. Uh, well, is this online? Yep. Yeah, it is. Okay. 
Um, uh, the scholarship which has gone, round, gone on around environmental justice, especially in, in the earlier years, I think, uh, was very critical of the administrative state, uh, certainly Roman Eckersley. Um, uh, I, I want to say a couple of things. First of all, capitalism. Um, a lot of us like, a lot of people like capitalism. Capitalism delivers a lot of stuff uh, which people like, right? Um, uh, secondly, the, there is an ethic behind capitalism. Um, and likewise, with the administrative state, with the democratic state, there's a lot to like about democracy. There's even a lot to like about the administrative state. But I think for the, for so to sort of pursue the environmental justice thesis, we have to take these positives and critique them and see what is going on in, in capitalism which is destructive. Because uh, we, there's much to like about capitalism, but there's much to, to uh, fill us with horror about capitalism. It's destroying the planet, basically. So uh, the democratic state is really the only way we have the only uh, sort of institution under the people's control which can actually make an impact on capitalism in some way. That's why I, I'm interested in what Strike has to say. Um, and uh, uh, look, can I just ask a question of people here? The, the two theorists I'm really interested in are Carl Polanyi, first of all. How many, how many people have ever heard of him? Oh, great. Yeah, how many people have read The Great Transformation? Yeah. Terrific. Uh, now, I think this is far more um, applicable in many ways than, than um, Marx's capital. Um, and, uh, you know, Marx had a lot of um, absolutely correct things to say about capitalism. But Karl Polanyi was talking about um, this balance between uh, the state, the, the, the administrative state, as was, um, and, and uh, the control of capitalism to try and basically keep the good things we like about capitalism without letting it destroy ourselves and the planet. Um, so what we find is these tensions constantly, these contradictions, these, um, uh, these pulls in different directions, things that we, we want, things that are both positive but cannot be reconciled. And we have to find a balance between them, it seems to me. Um, the, the other theorist, if I could just mention briefly, Martin Heidegger. Now, how, how many people know about Martin Heidegger? Oh yeah, good, excellent. Well, I was a bit obsessed by Heidegger, and um, I read uh, a bit about being and time, and I then tackled being and time, and I found it quite illuminating. Uh, particularly from the point of view of um, these ideas of who we are and how we see others. And Heidegger talks about this in terms of being. It's us, it's our being. And our being is not um, a subjective internal thing entirely. It's about how we, how we construct the world, how we make the things outside us. Um, so I can't... Uh, you know, Heidegger is, is kind of difficult um, for me to understand, uh, let alone interpret, let alone explain. But, you know, I do think there should be a, 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 bit, of a, a bit of a sort of con conversation around this sort of stuff. I've said enough, I think, and um, I haven't answered the question, but never mind. <laughs> <clears throat> I want to move from Heidegger to the IPCC, if I can do that. So, and I, I don't know how to make that segue. So. Um, <laughs> I, I want to ask Petra, um, I mean, the, that, that was fascinating, and that recognition and the focus on status injury and, the, and that sort of bringing of the local story, to, which is really what environmental justice has been about from the start, um, with different methodologies, of course. But you're working on an IPCC chapter, and you're w working to try and bring some sort of influence to uh, this sort of global negotiations. Uh, and I mean, how does that play? I mean, how, how, um, how does that sort of evolution of experience and that focus on experience work its way 
either into the document, and is, is there an issue there, and, and then does it, and this is sort of beyond the state, but to the global policy, does it have an influence? Like, can we address that status injury at that level? So what is it like? It's absolutely maddening. Uh, so for all those of you who are not too familiar with the IPCC, it's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's the scientific authority that is requested by the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, to produce every five to seven years the state-of-the-art scientific understanding on climate change. So I am right now co-leading a chapter in the 1.5 degree global warming special report of the IPCC. And the chapter is entitled Sustainable Development, Poverty Eradication and Reducing Inequalities. So how do I get my rebellious participatory action research persona into this chapter? As I said, absolutely maddening. Why is that? Well, because it's highly political, right? It's highly political. I was part of the group that drafted the original outline of the chapter. This is how it works. You know, a group gets together. The group discusses what a particular chapter should look like, what the title should be, what the bullet should be. And we originally had the title as Sustainable Development, Poverty Eradication, and Equity. We didn't dare justice. Justice would have had absolutely no possibility of, of being accepted by parties to the UN. But already equity proved problematic, and I suppose you can guess who the country, or the representation, representative of that country was who objected to equity. Well, it was the US, right, saying equity, hmm, equity is not just scientific, scientifically um, objective, it's policy prescriptive, it's normative. That's not what the IPCC should do. Um, we have just written the first draft of the chapter, there are several drafts, and we have... So for those of you who write manuscripts and send them off to reviewers, uh, you get reviewer comments back. You know, we all understand there's this 24-hour rule when you have the comments coming back. You can bitch for 24 hours, then you tackle them. You have 20 comments, maybe 30, maybe 50. We have 1,006 comments on the first chapter, on the first draft. All of them need to be answered, and the requests are 180 degrees contradictory. Again, the person from the U.S. State Department says, uh, equity, justice, fairness, human rights is beyond the scope of the chapter and beyond the scope of the IPCC. Whereas people from the Mary Robinson Foundation, who work, of course, on climate justice, said, wonderful, do more of it. Here are a hundred more pieces of literature you should take into consideration. It's politically very, very difficult. And of course, everything that comes out of the science report needs then to be approved by the UN. And I don't know how many of you were at the disastrous 2009 COP, Conference of the Parties in Copenhagen. You were there, right? Where the U.S. Special Envoy on Climate Change, Todd Stern, A, said, we were blissfully ignorant of the damaging forces of CO2 until very recently, which of course is a big lie. And he also said, we categorically reject all kinds of historic responsibility and justice because it means compensation, it means loss and damage, and it means trillions of dollars. So on the science assessment, we walked a very, very tight line between we need to stress it, and if we stress it too much, we risk having it cut out entirely when it's time for approval. So very, very tricky. Well, I, want, I want to thank our three initial speakers <clears throat> um, for starting us off. We're going to move to our second session. So can we just have a round of thanks, please? <laughs>